Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got a huge news week for Palantir. We did get an unconfirmed win for the NHS contract by Digital Health. Please note, though, the official statement from the NHS that procurement is still not concluded yet, but also lots of other little news with Germany, Kramer, Shyamon Podcast, Dan Ives, and many more. So looking at the stock first, we closed off the week at a nice recent high in the mid-19s. We finally broke through that resistance over there past the 19-teens. Now, the overall market also did well, regardless of Jerome Powell's statements that the Fed will do anything to ensure they do not have runaway inflation. But the market seems to disagree that we shouldn't see any more rate hikes in the future and at least see pauses now. So any decreases, I'm not sure, honestly, in my own opinion, how long that'll take. But as the overall market looks to be roaring along, this actually helps Palantir stock out a lot. So next will be interesting to see if this can continue or hold since we'd have to test if this range will be supported. First, we all know that the big news that Digital Health has said Palantir has won the FTP contract because ministers have signed off and that the announcement will happen in a few days. And I caution this in the video that this is unconfirmed still and it's being spotted by Digital Health, which has put their reputation on the line here by doing this and they made sure though to cover their bases that they went for an official comment to the NHS who said officially that the procurement process has not concluded so be careful there we are still in the wait and see phase to ensure this gets officially announced but surrounding that I put out other videos around the NHS and some risks regarding that and there was a bailout funding that was rejected and most speculated that the reasoning is that the funding would rather be spent on tax breaks due to the endless pit reputation of the NHS when it comes to funding now if it'll actually affect the contract itself that is yet to be seen maybe that money has been set aside already but in order to cover the shortfalls nhs england did have to reappropriate funds from several improvement initiatives now pounder does have current contracts with them and that's with the ftp transition for 25 million pounds now if that gets affected who knows but either way it looks like as long as pounder gets the win for the contract this shouldn't be an issue now, surrounding this also, there's been a lot of drama around the contract this whole week, too, from government officials themselves. David Davis spoke at the UK Parliament and literally said, looks like the company who's going to win this is Palantir. It is just the wrong company to put in charge of our precious data resource. Even if it behaved perfectly, nobody would trust it. So basically, the UK just has to figure out what they're going to do with this and try to figure out how they're going to stake up the reputation for the NHS. I mean, if you want to take this as good news, I said this also that it sounds like maybe it's in the bad because he is kind of acknowledging that Palantir is more likely to win this now. And then even if you're against it, there's really no point. But also, it's just another avenue for them to get flack and try to rile up public backlash against Palantir doing this so publicly on TV. There's clearly a disconnect here between the trust of the people, the solution that people are actually going to use, like the providers, and then the decision makers and winning the contract. So we'll just have to see what actually happens in the end here, and hopefully that all settles down once it's all finalized. And then we also got news that the NHS FTP contract is met with another delay in mid-November. Now, early in the week, this was before that we got this digital health article here. This is not surprising considering that the mid-October deadline came and passed. Now, the reasoning they said is because business use cases are still not thoroughly vetted enough. Essentially, they want Pounder to do more without winning the contract, or they need to clarify whoever the winner is, what exactly they are capable of, and able to provide it. Now, in regards to what the NHS or UK government is looking for, it was referenced that they want to know how the patient care interaction will be improved. So it's not necessarily how they become more efficient as a health system, but rather to make the provider who interacts with patients much better. And what makes their life easier? And honestly, that's a fair thing to ask for because the point of the NHS is to improve the health of the UK and to do that as direct as possible means working with the providers. So more to see if we get official resolutions to this NHS contract. Now the drama also continues in Germany in regards to using Palantir with their police force. So the state of Bavaria's newly elected state government is backing their continued use of Palantir but working and waiting to see if they can push it all the way to the other states. Now, with the federal government in power in Germany, this seems unlikely to be resolved, in my own opinion, anytime soon in Palantir's favor. But if they continue to survive within individual states like Bavaria, Hesse, and North Rhine-Westphalia, or NRW, I'll continue to monitor the situation since it is big enough for Palantir to acknowledge with Alex Karp in the earnings call that some choice words there for Q3 earnings call regarding the push against them in Germany and also France, that he really doesn't agree with what they're trying to do in building out their own solutions. And then next year, we had a warning. This is not news, real news to me at least. But just so you're in the know, Pouncer came up in a lightning round from the viewer in Georgia um, on Jim Kramer's show. And this was on Monday for CNBC. 
He said they had a dynamite quarter and says to buy, 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 pushing that button there. It's kind of annoying. And says they're on that Palantir team and calls himself Mr. Palantir, the greatest phrase. So I'm not saying this is actual news here or if it really means anything. But the one shining light is that either way, at least Palantir's name is out there on the mainstream media and just gets more people, at least impressions on their name and gets them at least name recognition possibly for other people who may have heard about them, but now they might look a little bit further into them. So as an investor, it doesn't matter to me if there's other investors figuring it out, but what matters is if there's a potential customer or C-suite executive who hears about this and potentially at least wants to look a little further into it and possibly become a customer. And then Citibank also continues to keep their sell rating for Palantir. The analyst, Tyler Radke, keeps the $10 price target, which is almost half the price it is now. I think we're around the $18 range. They acknowledge that Palantir's revenue was within expectations, so that's at least driven by their commercial performance. However, the narrative for them is that they don't like government revenue. They think it looks weak. Now, we know that it's going to be lumpy, and this happens where they just have very low growth, but also sometimes they have high growth. Now, they also note profitability also exceeded expectations but they're still observing and they're in a wait and see kind of moment here that AIP and the boot camps are actually going to work and scale out and bring in customers for the company. So they sound like they don't want to get overly eager here and put all their eggs in a basket, of course, so early and still in a wait and see mode since they want to see the sustainability of this turnaround and growth, which honestly is a big question for myself too, as a Palantir investor. When we saw that 13% quarterly growth. That wasn't good at all. But now that we've turned it around at least for one quarter now to 17%, I want to see if this continues going up or at least maintains in the short term. Then we have Hirsch Jane, the head of public health at Palantir. He did a huge whole panel interview at the Milken Institute's Future Health Summit. There's a bunch of other speakers, but out of that 40 minutes, he did get a good 10 minutes there and he was able to talk about Palantir, their philosophy, their background, their origins, but with also data and how they have a philosophy around that. But more importantly, their growing significance in the healthcare space and the ways that they're actually trying to help and improve that. So you can check out the whole panel or my video for my thoughts, but essentially Pounder gets more opportunities like this to get their name out there and teach the public potential customers how they are in the healthcare space at all areas of the ecosystem. We know that they're in the supply chain side, but they're also in drug discovery, as well as on the floor with nurses and scheduling them out at hospitals. So they're pretty much everywhere and they have a possibility to get in at different institutions this way. Then Palantir also posted a video on how their AIP boot camps start out for clients where they introduce time to building up their intuition with AI. And I did a whole video that summarized but also talked about the merits of the video post because I believe they did a good job in executing this with using real business language with a demo that even I believe non-technical people can use and honestly that helps with scalability. IT showcases the real life usage of AI, albeit it may be a simple example in the beginning, but either way, I can see a person at a company showing this to their manager, director, or sharing it amongst themselves even in the C-suite to at least convince someone or their boss of the possible merits of attending an AIP bootcamp. And the best part is here is that there's not really much you need to do. You either get a real use case out of it in the end, or there is no commitment, and you don't have to sign a multi-million dollar contract with Palantir like you had to do before. Now, this is what I haven't made videos on. Shyam Sankar was on the Defense and Aerospace Daily podcast on November 7th. He talks about the significance of Palantir in the space and is widely known and talked about already, but always great to hear him drop nuggets about artificial intelligence and how they continue to serve the defense and aerospace industry. And shout out to Adam2 on XFinance411 who posted the whole podcast there. So if you want to support him, please stop by his video and listen to it on there if you'd like. Then, upcoming next week on November 16, AWS is hosting an Explore Supply Chain Optimization, Making Theory a Reality Talk. Alongside AWS, Monique Sharma, who is the supply chain and digital solutions expert at Palantir, will also be a guest there. And this is huge because working with big cloud providers, you can get your name out there and brand hack alongside the widespread reputation of AWS with Palantir Solutions. So keep an eye out for that. I'll try to find information when it's available. It's just nice to see Palantir associated with trillion dollar companies because it's what they provide as value to them as something to host, then it's just another leading indicator, at least in scalability, that they have an infrastructure to pull off of this kind of value that they want to bring to the widespread market. And if they both grow together, that's a big win. 
And then Dan Ives does his media rounds and asks about tech. He gets to talk about Palantir, calls them the golden child. He really likes the building of use cases. And for me personally, I see this as more opportunities to set the foundation of Palantir being able to scale within and across industries. As long as they can take their leadership from what these clients find important, it makes sense to standardize these over time as they bring value. And as long as they can take their learnings from what clients find important, it makes sense to standardize these over time as use cases as they bring value and they just come out of the box. He's been a Palantir bull here that really started that first spike in the price all the way into the 20s earlier in the year. I just find it fascinating where we are today and his consistency in standing behind the company right now. Albeit, Palantir didn't make it too hard to do so with their better revenue growth in Q3 at 17% versus at 13%. But still, being able to put yourself out there publicly with a reputation can be difficult if a company is not living up to the message you're putting out. But let me know down below what you think about all these news stories for the weekly Palantir.